Hi there, welcome to The Big Interview, I'm Graham. Today's guest is Darren Anderton, an exceptionally talented two-footed footballer whose influence on every team he played with during the 90s, I think, is vastly underrated. A real talent. But he spent most of that extremely successful career playing for Spurs in England. If you've been listening to the Big Interview series for a while now, You'll already know how much we enjoy stories about how the wonderful footballers or coaches or presidents or actors or comedians get their break, where they come from, what shapes them and who shapes them. For Darren Anderton, it's really fundamentally about one man, his dad. This was the guiding voice in Darren's life and his career. But Darren explains with some detail that life was difficult for his dad, who was Scottish from Motherwell. In fact, did you know that not only could Darren have played for Scotland, he very nearly did. Anyway, it was Darren's dad's phone call to Portsmouth saying, I think my boy can play a bit and you should check him out, that put our guest today on the road to greatness and on the road to a little bit of bother. For those who aren't initiated... There's a bigger rival than Scotland and England, where Darren had to choose, and was happy with his choice, and that rivalry is Southampton and Portsmouth. I'll let him explain. With the Euros on the horizon, delayed by a year, but nonetheless tantalising this summer, what better player to discuss two majestic tournaments, Euro 96 and France 98, both of which I worked at, but in the case of the latter tournament, that explosive, colourful, ultimately red, white and blue World Cup, I was there to cover Darren and England. We start with Terry Venable's team at the home Euros and what Darren describes as the magical minute that made the summer of 1996. Yes, yes, there's going to be chat about David Baddiel, the Lightning Seeds, Wembley. Gary McAllister, Yuri Geller, David Seaman, and that bloke with the funny hairstyle. What was his name again? Gaza? Something like that. Then, skipping forward to France, we discuss a thrilling game against Argentina, one of the modern classics of the World Cup, a game which had just about everything except a useful referee. To this day, even though I'm a Scot, I think England were done a huge misjustice by Kim Milton Nielsen, somebody who didn't know how to interpret either the laws of FIFA nor the direct instructions given to referees before France 98. I will let Darren explain. Of course, we make lots of time for Spurs too, and in particular a footballer that we haven't spoken about nearly enough in this series, but one we'd love to have on as a guest, the mighty Teddy Sheringham. One of the most gifted, intelligent, and f- just flipping fun to watch footballers of my career. Teddy, are you listening? We go into depth on Teddy Sheringham's skills and his ideas about the game, but also what he was like as a person, because Darren and he formed a really nice partnership for Spurs. One which Darren helped maintain when Alex Ferguson wanted Darren to challenge David Beckham on the right wing, or maybe even join the centre midfield of Manchester United. Later, Teddy broke that partnership. Darren's funny on that. Look, thank you to Darren Anderton for waking up early on the west coast of America to talk to us and to Josh and Eli at Barefaced Talent for arranging the alarm call and suggesting to Mr Anderton it was a good idea that he join us. I really enjoyed it. The key thing here is Darren had a rich, interesting, up-and-down career full of the pain that you have to suffer to become an intensely successful sportsman, I think, or woman. But above all, he's really good at describing it. He's terrifically articulate. He still has total recall on all of the major incidents, and he puts everything into it. I think you're really going to enjoy this. Big interview listeners, have a great time with Darren Anderton. And once you have enjoyed it, please tell a friend. Or an enemy. I don't care. Spread the word. Thank you.
Listeners, we love you. There have been 20 million over you over the what's nearly now six years of the big interview. I'm in the lucky position to express real enthusiasm, natural, unbridled enthusiasm. You all know me for that, <laughs> because we choose our guests really carefully, and, and the guest has to mean something to us. And therefore, I say again today that we're pretty privileged because we're about to talk to an exceptional footballer, a man of high achievement, a high skill, a real clear, visionary football brain, and also somebody who's nicking around in another part of the world now, so he's got a, a scratcher at a very early hour. I'm pleased to welcome um, Blair Pompey to the big interview. <laughs> Darren Spurs and England legend, Darren Anderton. Darren, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Darren, you, you're, you're, you're a little bit aware of what we do in this, and I have to start the interview by, by telling you that I'm, I'm mad as hell. It's, <laughs> it's, it's qualifying for the Qatar World Cup time, and Scotland's opponents, Austria, I've named a 43-man squad. They genuinely have named a 43-man squad. Didn't know they had 43 players. They, well, <laughs> they, whether they do or they don't, the sport is being named in there. And, and they say it's to do with some of the Bundesliga stars might not be allowed to come over. But I know it's fear. It's pure fear at the mighty Scotland. I know you're in great nick. I know that you've got a past that we're going to have to speak about that wears a different colour shirt. But are you available for the qualifying campaign and indeed for the Euro <laughs> Championships this summer? And, and what's your mental disposition to the country of the country of your heritage? Well, yes, I would love to be available for that uh, job. Job done. Um, I, I I always did think if if I ended up playing for Scotland, I might have got a few more caps. To be fair, a <laughs> hundred and thirty odd. It would have been absolutely. <laughs> And we'd have loved you. We'd have loved you so much. <laughs> but I, ha- I have to start and pay tribute to somebody who's been, who was just gigantic throughout your life and your career and who patently was a man of character and, and good brain and to whom you are a lot. Your dad was born in Motherwell. Not everybody listening to this is, is going to know where that is. But it was a traditional yeah. blue-collar, steel time a real working town where, where men of, and women of character came from. If I talked about your dad as being um, down to earth, smart, <laughs> to the point, fun, quite hard, as mother of characters are supposed to, am I beginning to scratch the surface of that, that wonderful man? Oh, for sure. I think, the, I think you've said it all there. I mean, it's the perfect way to describe him. He really was very down to earth. Um, kept things real, which was, of course, was very good for me uh, as I embarked on a, a career which, you know, lots of highs and lows. So it keeps you very grounded, especially in my early years when it felt like my career was just a, an upward curve of, of many, many, many positives. But he was always there to have a little bit of a giggle and a joke about things and, and keep my feet on the ground. And, uh, you know, he was a, he was my best friend, um, very honest um, not in terms of, you know, if I played badly or anything, he would criticise. He would just say, well, never mind, on to the next one. Um, he, he knew I was a very frus- frustrated person when playing football, especially when I used to play out wide and always wanted to do well, always wanted to, you know, make things happen. And some games that doesn't happen and you get a little bit frustrated playing wide and you try and do too much when you do get the ball, maybe for the first time in five minutes, instead of just popping it off and going again and getting yourself going. And he just sometimes would just say, well, just, you know, always do the right thing. Don't force it. You know, <laughs> you know what's the right thing. I mean, my dad didn't claim to have a great knowledge of the game, but I think he had a great knowledge of me and my mentality and that sort of thing. So that would always be kind of funny after after games. And I would come into the players' lounge, even when I started at Portsmouth, um, and then on, of course, on at Tottenham, my dad would sit there very calm and just say, well, well, well played today. Yeah, good effort. And then my mum would be the one sat next to him asking the hundred questions. What did the manager say? What this? So my dad ended up having a, a nickname for, for her called C-Fax. <laughs> In terms of every time I'd walk up and I'm shattered and my dad would like... Just someone just go and grab him a beer or go and grab him a drink, you know. You know, let's start this interview now. It was hilarious. And she's just so excitable and and loved it. Whereas my dad was such a calm and influence after those games. Even when like I come out of a game sometimes, you know, fuming that, that you know, how the game had gone and that but that just calmness and 
reality of everything, it really... It, it really helped. And I think more you, I think about it and talk about it, the more I realise that. And I, I guess you take it for granted because that's how he is. But it also made you realise that, yes, football is so much, so intense. You work and train for that reason, to play on a Saturday at three o'clock. And that's what it's all about. When it doesn't go well, it feels awful. And that reality and that calmness that my dad had always just brought things down to, you know, back down to reality that I'm doing the thing I love there's going to be a game next week. You're going to go training on Monday. And you'd have forgotten about it. And, and that really helped, especially in my early years. I'm struck by you saying, Dan, about how well, he, however he, how intimately he understood football, he knew you really well. And I suppose in situations like that, it's a little bit like having in your family to your right-hand side as your most trusted person. One of these yeah. things that people now go to, which is, Coaches who help with your psychology, who can keep you on the straight and narrow. Yeah. But, but most people are parents, not unfortunately, not all sportsmen and women that go on yeah. a parental. But all the parental experiences, I think, are really different. And one small example is I was recently interviewing the Barcelona striker Martin Brathwaite, and he said that his Diane, his, his dad from Guyana, who had been brought up in New York, was ultra hard with him in Denmark pushed him, criticised him to the point that Martin said, I, I didn't feel loved. And now he realises that the things that his dad were, were, was drilling into him have benefited him. They're close as anything now. But he went through a spell where he, he didn't feel particularly, he felt challenged and not particularly loved. Clearly what you got from your father was astute in that he knew exactly what to do to get the best out of you in good and bad circumstances, whether you're as a teenager or latterly as you're breaking through and becoming a, a big star? Well, I think that really comes back to my childhood in general in the fact that my mum and dad got divorced uh, when I was around 10, which was a tough, tough age. I had two, uh, younger siblings, uh, two brothers, one would have been eight, one six, and then a sister who was the twin to the youngest at six. So <clears throat> um, I guess I kind of grew up quickly and I knew what was going on in my, my younger uh, brothers and sisters didn't really, and my mum was leaving to, you know, we, uh, and we were going with her to be live with someone else at another man's house. It was not very nice. Um, see, you, you know, the house you live in, you see your dad crying as you're leaving, and that sort of thing. Fortunately, we <coughs> caused such a ruckus <laughs> at my mum's new place with the the new uh, her new partner that. I think in the end it was it's either it's either them or us, <laughs> and <clears throat> my um, you know my dad was still live at the same house. He didn't jump ship and go off and let's you know go and live in Spain or something like that, which he could quite easily be. He was so upset about it, but he we would go to his house every day after school because the school playing field was behind our garden. Um, and it wasn't anything against my mum. It was just one of those things that that was our family home. That's where we wanted to be. And so we ended up going back to my dad's. My mum would come and cook us dinner every night, but also help show my dad how to cook a dinner. So all these things I had to watch and see my dad learn and be this person that he really wasn't. He was a removal man. He was very simple. Uh, never cooked in his life. And now he's cooking for four children, um, at an age which he, you know, I'm, my, I'm sure my mum did everything up until that point. But we got the best of both worlds. I were very lucky that both my mum and dad, the way that they s uh, sorted that all out was my mum would come over every day and help cook dinner, be there, and then go off to her house and be with her new husband and uh, partner. So... Um, we're very, very lucky because of that. But also, I think at that time, I then became my dad's best friend. I would sit with him every night and watch the football or, you know, before he'd go out to work, you know, because there was like the property crash and so the removal business went pear-shaped. He ended up being a taxi driver. So I could just sit there and talk about football with my dad all day, all night. I would play all day. And I think that was just it. I think he just... He he would never scream and shout on the sidelines watching games and that sort of thing. So, of course, for me, whenever I see that from kids and I see or I speak to friends 
talking about their kids playing and they're so into it and they're just too much in my opinion I just had that carbon influence from my dad A as a kid growing up and B as trying to be a footballer and and it and throughout my career in everything up until the, unfortunately when he passed away he was always the first person I would I would speak to and whether I felt good or bad he always made me feel good great and that that's what it was all about and, and I think that comes from that the way that he dealt with our upbringing I mean he could I mean if you'd known him before that there's no way he could bring up four kids up on his own basically but he did it because he and that's what it comes down he just loved us and was um, everything was about us and of course it's very difficult as a kid trying to be a professional footballer so many ups and downs and his advice certainly helped it's an exceptional testimonial to be able to give to a parent, mother or father. It's, yeah. it's, it's brilliant to hear because to be able to yeah. say that about a parent is wonderful. Um, yeah. As a Scot, I mean, he and I are different, slightly different generations, <clears throat> but we, we share some traits, I'm sure. As a nation, we tend to get a little bit more Scottish the further away we get from Scotland. <laughs> and, and just by coincidence, again, I interviewed Scott McTominay recently, who, who grew up in the northwest just outside Manchester, played all day in the garden with his dad at football and still does to this day as a Manchester United midfielder. He said, oh, in fact, I've, I've got to go at the end of this interview. I've got to go and play football with my dad in the garden. Oh, I love which that. Is a nice now, for yeah. him and his dad, there was no question that when Scott were interested, what they would choose, nor for you was there really any question. Although you gave us the benefit of a shot and Andy Rocks would have <laughs> dropped the ball. <laughs> If only it had been different. But in your heart and your, your soul and your idea, there was no, no, no doubt at all that if England were calling, that you were English. But again, I'm just, for the last bit about your dad, I'm interested about how, how Scottish he was how, before you become an England international, how much his hopes might have been that you, you might go and play for his country if it didn't feel like your country. Yeah, possibly. I mean, it was a strange one, really, because, I mean, he ended up going... Um, he's lost his dad when he was two, so he wouldn't have known much about him. Um, his then stepdad uh, was from England and uh, ended up... He ended up going to boarding school in Jersey uh, and then ended up, from there, moving... The family were in Southampton, so that's where he ended up being, and that's why we... we our family is from, from there, but... Um, he always told me stories about how he used to play for Rangers. <laughs> and he'd make up these stories. And I would go on um, journeys with him to Scotland when he did his removals. And it would be like, oh, you know, overnight stays. And I just, obviously, I just loved it. And it was him and his workman, his pal John. And my dad would just tell these stories. Uh, and I believe them. I believe them all that my dad was this footballer that played for Rangers. Now he scored these goals and he did this and he did that. And of course, uh, once I started getting to 10, 11, I'm playing in <laughs> football in the garden. I realised just how useless my dad was. Funny enough, when I did go up to Scotland for that trial, um, and I went up the night before my dad took, you know, to, my sister came as well. She was only little. We drove up. My dad took us, you know, showed me our eyebrows and showed showed me Celtic Park and all that. And it was, yeah. So I, I, he didn't carp on about it in any way. I knew he was Scottish. I knew, you know, he used to take me to watch Southampton. So I felt like that was probably like his team. Um, but I knew that these stories and everything else that he has, a, you know, a strong bond with where he was from in Scotland. So what. I was so appreciative, like hopefully you can tell, about what he had done for me, not just to become a footballer and have a chance of being one, but to the way that I grew up and, you know, I was very spoiled to go that way because, you know, broken families can be really tough for kids. So when the opportunity came that Graham Padden said, look, you know, Scotland, you know, they've been on the phone, there's some trial, they want you to go and and I was like, oh, yeah. And, And for that reason solely... I mean, in hindsight, I'm glad that it didn't work out, of course. I didn't have to make that decision. But the sole reason I felt like I was doing it was a, a thank you to him for what he had done for me. It's really nice. I, I hate doing this because I've, I've, I've mentioned three other, two other people already and I wasn't intending it. In fact, I was, this is typical of these interviews. You've, you've opened up a world of adventure to me because we were listening back to maybe the second or third big interview that we did 
all those years ago, and it was Chrissy Waddle. And I just said to him off the top of my head, a, a player with whom you share ability and vision and use of the ball, and, and that's meant to be a big compliment because I think Chris Waddle had a lot of Brazilian genes in him. You know, you know what I'm saying? But he told, I said, oh, you're, we're about the same age. Do you remember when you watched the 1966 World Cup? He said, yeah, I can tell you all about it. He said, we lived up north, just outside Newcastle. He said, me and my, my two brothers, three of us, my mum and dad, in an old-fashioned um, British motorcycle with a sidecar. And, and his mum's sister lived in Watford. So the five of them drove down for their summer holidays from just outside Newcastle and these newly constructed roads and waterways down to Watford to be there for the summer and to watch the World Cup final with his auntie. He said the three boys were changing positions and crawling over each other as they drove in the sidecar or whatever. That enchanted me, and thank God they made it do because Chrissy Waddle was a gift from God for everybody who loves football. But being on the road in a massive, great, big furniture pantechnican with your sister, your dad, and his pal, sometimes up in the cab, sometimes back in the thing, and, and coming to strange places you've never seen before, all the noise and the shouting and the hefting, that must have been just a magical experience for a kid. It was. Yeah, it really was. I mean, my dad always used to tell the story about how me helping usually meant I would pick a chair up and go to the front door and plonk it in the middle of the hallway in the front door. And as they come in with the big heavy stuff, they're like, someone moved that chair. <laughs> Darren's just dumped the chair in the middle of the hallway again. He just loved having me there. But it was, um, it was fun times. It was an adventure. Exactly what it was. I absolutely loved it. How did you end up uh, playing for Pompey? Uh, that would be... Down to him, really, because, as I said, his knowledge wasn't great of football, I didn't feel, and his t talent most certainly wasn't. I mean, I've watched him kick a football back at a training g game and end up breaking his toe and things like that. He was absolutely useless. And that was the... F God knows where I got it from. But um, I was playing for the Southampton schoolboys, which is like the under-14 teams, which is um, the city. And we would play every Saturday morning... And then you'd play for your club team on a Sunday. Uh, in that Southampton team, there was probably four or five of the lads were with the Southampton Academy, which was always a very good academy, a team I supported as a kid. Um, but they would watch the games. They would come and watch the, you know, their boys playing in those games. And they never once asked me to join or do anything like that. And my dad, who didn't have the greatest knowledge, I didn't think, just thought that I was on a, a level playing field with some of those boys and I was, you know, I was doing pretty good. So he just called Portsmouth and as a team, the closest team to us, spoke to Dave Hurst. He said, yeah, I'll come and watch. And I played in another game. My dad didn't, wasn't at that one. He was taking my younger brother to go and watch him play for the Southampton under 11s or something. My mum was at the game. We stood there as I came out of the change rooms after the game and a guy came up to us and said, hi, you, uh, Darren Anderson, right? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He went, oh, uh, hi, said hi to my mum. He said, uh, your dad called me this week and asked me to come and watch you play. I'm from Portsmouth. And, uh, yeah, I think you did really good. I, you know, you try, you try and do all, all things the right way. Um, can we come around and have a chat with you this week? I'm like, yeah, of course. Um, so that week, my mum came down to the house in the evening and Dave Hurst came round and asked me to sign associate schoolboy forms. And that, that was it. It was from there. I'd go and train once a week. It was amazing. Being, Alan Ball was the manager <coughs> of the first team and would take us training on a Thursday. So to have that was incredible. Peter Osgood, uh, Dave Thomas, who was a winger at Everton, um, amazing upbringing I mean to go and just once a week still do your fun football play for your schools do all that all the boys at Southampton they weren't allowed to play in their in their what I would call fun football on a Sunday they missed out on that I ended up getting an apprenticeship I was the last one to get picked I wasn't I was we played some trial games I was on the bench I remember they kept saying that I wasn't strong enough they put on some a, a little lad in front of me in one of these games and I came on maybe for the last four minutes I was so disgruntled I remember saying to my dad I'm not, I'm not there's no point what, what, what's, what am I doing and 
he just, it was start of January, I think, and he just said, well, you've got about six weeks of going once a week training. There'll be a couple more games. <clears throat> if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen, but you never know. And he was right. Um, there was the last trial game, I think it was. Uh, we played against the, Na- the Navy down there. Alan Ball was there watching. I played right midfield. Daryl Powell, who went on and played for Derby and Portsmouth as well, he was playing right back and he'd already got his apprenticeship. He was the star, one of the star boys. Good. He was the top, top player. He just kept getting, getting the ball, giving it to me. I kept doing my little bits and never give the ball away in a, a whole half. Alan Ball was up, stood on that side of the pitch where my dad was and he knew my dad because my brother and his son played in the same Sunday team. Windsor and Southampton. So he just turned around to my dad and he said, your boy's got a chance. He does everything right. I mean, he's got to get stronger. He's got to... But I love it. He does everything right. And that, and that was it. He just... From when I was thinking I wasn't going to get that opportunity, two days later, I signed an apprenticeship at Portsmouth. And that was it. And my dad, who... Uh, all he wanted was for me to get a chance because he just knew how much I wanted it. He, he knew I had ability, but on top of that, he knew how hard I worked at it. And the one thing he did have, he was a cross-country runner as a, growing up. He was so, uh, And I definitely got that gene, and I could run all day, and I would win the Hampshire Cross-Country Championships, Hampshire and Surrey, so, Southern England, so I could run all day. He just felt that if I got that opportunity to go and train every day for two years as an apprentice in the youth team, that my ability would shine through. And I, and he was right. It, I couldn't believe how much I improved from 16 to, to 18. We're already identifying the character that made you such a successful sportsman because the England-Scotland debate is one thing, but to be a Southampton boy and change the Portsmouth, people listening... People won't know. I mean, never mind what you went through. The, the Southampton Pompey thing is is try and put it into some words or emotions because I'd almost go so far as to say hatred. I think it is. It's really strange. And I think the fact that they've been in different leagues at times over the years meant there were less games. So when it happened, it was even even worse. Uh, it was it was toxic for sure. And as a Southampton boy, being a Southampton fan, uh, I didn't really get it because I was just a kid and I just, yeah, I wanted Southampton to win and then I wanted Portsmouth to win. They're two teams. I mean, n- no big deal. It wasn't good, you know, d- didn't happen, unfortunately. And I remember when I was at Portsmouth, people didn't really know who I was, so I could still be in Southampton, go out with my mates, who obviously were all Southampton fans, and we, n- no big deal. When I signed for Spurs, different story. First game <laughs> away, away at Southampton, opening day of the Premier League when the Premier League started. Terrible game. I got abused left, right and centre. I remember taking a throw in right where I used to sit. And these people who I literally sat with four years earlier were, I mean, they were almost spitting on me. It was unbelievable. That It was pure hatred. Uh, Franny Benali elbowed me in the last minute, eight stitches above my eye, the biggest roar of the day. Um, it, it was unreal. Uh, unbelievable. What a debut. I was like, oh my God, this is... God, I used to think this was fun, but um, it was it was some debut. But then going on from there, I ended up, of course, playing for England and go still want to come back, but every opportunity to come and see my dad and my family and friends go out in Southampton. In the end, I, I had to stop doing it. It was it was it got nasty. People were pretty nasty about it all. And um, from that point, I ended up go when I came down. I go out down to Bournemouth. Um, just get away from it and end up buying a home there. And that's why, uh, you know, my association with Bournemouth started then and I ended up playing there for that reason. Yeah, we, we've been down that neck of the woods to speak to Harry Redknapp and Suey a couple of times and we just call Bournemouth and Pool the neutral zone. We've got, we've, got, we've got really good fans, supporters who've been with us all the time and we've got sponsors. I'll start with one of our supporters, Will McLeod. He's a socio. Darren... Will just loves you. He, he's written an essay about you here. Um, and if I take off the, the top of it, 
what a career Dan had. Even if you limit it to the years he spent at Tottenham, I think his move to Spurs coincided with the back pass rule and he left Tottenham the year after Abramovich bought Chelsea. The change in the Premier League in that span makes my head spin. I've been reading old interviews of Darren's and I really love his candour. Even when he was still playing, he would speak his mind. So I'm, I'm hugely looking forward to the interview. My question is really threefold, and here he says, apologies for how long-winded it is, and I've, I've taken a good chunk out of Will's question. Darren played in different roles in Spurs teams over the years and in England teams under different managers as well as, as many spells at other clubs. In purely football terms, which team played the best soccer? Which team did you enjoy playing in the most? And which team got the best out of you? So it is three sections. Which side were you in that played the, the absolute best football? Which in which one did you enjoy yourself most, and which team got the best out of you? Well, I think I was very fortunate, um, especially with the my England time to play under Terry Venables, who is for me the best manager and coach I ever played for by by a long way. Just an incredible man. Uh, I loved playing for Glenn Hoddle. The way that he got the team to play was, I mean, he was so far ahead of his time. I think and. It was the perfect international manager for those reasons. Uh, that World Cup team in 98 was such a good team to play in. Of course, everyone talks about Euro 96, myself included. Um, I loved playing for England when I first got in. I then changed Terry Venables then for Euro 96, played me as a wing back, which was fine, but meant less protection defect from a defender behind me makes you feel very uncomfortable as a winger um, because you that's not what you're good at, but you do it. And I, and the reason I think me and Maka were chosen in those roles was to make it an attacking formation, which it obviously was, uh, but we're obviously we're both limited in our defending ability, but both have a go. Um, so I found that tough, uh, no doubt about it. I most certainly enjoyed playing as a right midfielder with a right back behind me to offer that sort of protection and not feel like I was it was one on one against me if I had a flying full back like a Roberto Carlos or something like that it'd be like oh my god just just get rid of it will you pass it please in terms of team I enjoyed playing in probably the most uh, Spurs would probably have to be under it, what started as Ozzy Ardiles at the start of the 94 95 season and ended with Jerry Francis uh that created the right balance of a team that played the most exciting football with exciting players. Uh, I loved it so much. I mean, Ozzy when he brought Jurgen Klinsmann to the club was what a what a. It almost felt like it was changing football. Um, the way that Ozzy wanted our team to play uh, defensively, we just weren't good enough. If I mean, we passed it and passed it. It was no, you know it. It was so different. Movement, give the ball to people, even if they're under pressure. Vinny Samways was unbelievable at that. No matter where he was on the pitch, if the crowd were booing him, it'd still give, give it to me. He was an unbelievable player. And it, things started from there. And then, of course, we had myself, Teddy, Jürgen, Nicky Barnby, what a player he was. Popescu centrally. I mean... When Jerry Francis came in, when he started, we played Sheffield Wednesday away. What a great game. We won 4-3. That's how football should be. Entertaining. Teams worked us out and worked out that if you if you defend properly, you can hit them on the counter-attack. That's but not because it was the famous five. It was There was about eight that would bomb forward. Full-backs bomb forward. Midfielders, two centre-backs, Colin Coldwood sat in front and that's it. Um, so they worked that out. Jerry Francis came in and worked us with a rigid four four two with all the, that quality still and it was it was a really top top team i think I think if we kept that team together the following year uh if i didn 't start picking up the injuries of the next couple of years, that team could have definitely challenged thirty six five our sponsors and they 've asked their simple question is what was it like to be part of the euro ninety six team that went all the way to the semi final I can say that as a Scot who, I'm proud of my nation and I like to see my club Aberdeen do brilliantly. They're the only one I support. But I was down in England, I was earning my living there. I was covering that England team and I found them exciting. But also I think that I don't know whether you were incarcerated away from what was going on in the country because it was an astonishing time. 
there was a sense of change, there was a sense of creativity, of energy. And clearly, if you were English at that time in Euro 96, there was this feeling of flowering, irrespective of the song and it's coming home. It just seemed as if everything was clicking at the same time. I don't know if you were housed at Bisham Abbey or, or, or where you were, but I remember once speaking to Maka about that and him saying that as a northern guy coming down, he expected cliques, but Ted Buxton and Terry would make sure that everybody mingled after supper or whatever. I, I think matches where you want to, but the feeling of that that summer, that incredible summer. Darren, you're 96, the, the things that stand out for you. It's the feeling that you get from it that gives you a little, a little tingle. Just that, for that reason, I think it all came together. It started slowly. So Terry Venables, yes, and Ted Butts and Brian Robson, there's no clicks. They've been there, done it. The players, of course, it comes down to the players as well. That they, We had eight or nine captains in that team. They were incredible. They were leaders. You know, there was no, definitely no clicks. Everyone knew that they were top, top players, but also that it was a team. And that comes down to Terry Venables, making sure that happens, giving you your, your night out, even if it, you know, it didn't work out as it should. Getting abused by the media like we did became a little bit of a closed ship. You know, let's stick together. No, no, we're just not going to say a lot. We're going to deal with it in-house. Exactly what Terry did. You know, he was going to give us another night off to go home or do whatever you wanted uh, what would have been after the Scotland game, but because of the Switzerland game, a couple of the boys got photographed coming out of a restaurant or a bar. Terry just said, look, I just can't do it. We'll bring all the families down and you can go and see them on a Sunday in the day and do whatever you want, just be back for dinner at 7 o'clock. So you just respected that. You knew that he couldn't let you go and have your night out after the Scotland game. Back to the hotel, we'll have a few beers, let's enjoy it, we've got a game Wednesday. That's... That feeling of that, that we were shut away. But then when you left and you went to games and the, the flags and the people on bridges going down the M40, A40 towards, Wen towards Wembley, as you got closer and closer and people and people, it felt like you were part of something special. It felt like you were a, a rock star. It was madness. And whoever we were, I mean, Gazza obviously had had all that, no doubt about it, but um, no one ever experienced that. No one was ever going to experience it again. It was it was incredible. And, and then after the Scotland game and then the song comes on after the game and the whole crowd stay there and enjoy it. That was the moment, of course, that mad minute where... You know, Scotland missed the pen and then Gaza goes and scores the one to go up the other end. Um, that moment, I feel, that minute is what made that whole summer click. Never mind man, Mad Minute and Gaza scoring because you're in it. And we like to talk about football vision and intelligence in this. So, again, Gary McAllister was a guest in this season. I was speaking to me. Actually, he sends his regards. I was speaking to him half an hour ago. <clears throat> He's now a champion at Rangers with Stephen Gerrard. And, and I thought, given what happened to him on that afternoon it was it was bigger than to say please send Darren my bit but he did there's a penalty awarded Gary you'd have thought would be a, a nine out of ten eight out of ten finisher from 11 meters out David Seaman top class might save it but clearly at the time you can see it, it does roll Gary has said that prior to the tournament uh Yuri Geller had said he put crystals all over the place when we were interviewing Gary for the big interview Yuri Geller phoned him during the interview. Literally, we're in Leeds as he's describing what happened. Now, that is spooky. But you're on the pitch. Um, you've got the possibility of, of giving away a goal. David Seaman gets the ball. Can you remember, even if you have to make it up, asterisk, your thought process? Or, or did you have an established pattern when something might turn around in a game? So it's a penalty. Do you, do you remember even thinking about where you have to move as David Seaman's getting the ball out, which I think is to Teddy. Because famously, you, you you position yourself and you look to see where the ball might go, should go. I don't know, maybe it's a blur, or, or maybe your memories are just from having looked at it back. But you you were a fun that your brain and your vision were fundamental parts of that goal. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, the initial reaction is, oh, shit, what have we done? It's deja vu from the previous Saturday against Switzerland. I mean, we definitely played a bit better against Scotland up to that point, but it was 
a similar thing. You know, we started, we got the goal, then Switzerland came back into the game. So you, you're straight away thinking, oh no, we, they, we've blown it here. We're in big, big trouble. And I think if that goal goes in, the confidence completely drains out of us. No doubt about it, after what happened the week before. So, I mean, what a moment, then that lift and, you know, just running up the pitch. Of course, I've played with Teddy now, the relationship we have. I know that he brings the ball down. I'm against the thing. I can, you know, you can see the run coming from Gaza. Go on, Ted, pass, pass up, you know, third man run, Gaza's in. You know, it, it, it's there. You can see it all happening in front of you. So as the ball comes to me, it's a, it's a pretty simple ball, you know, played into his path. And then you just think, I mean, I thought he was going to hit it, you know, with his left foot myself, but... When he, it became slow motion. There's no doubt about it. Um, it's like, oh wow, this is gonna, this is this is the one. And of course, when you're involved in a goal as well, as well, that you even get that extra little bit of a buzz. And you know, I always enjoyed being part of setting up goals and that sort of thing. Which, which, of course, when it's a great goal like that, it's it's even even better in a game like that um, against Scotland with the, what we've already spoke about about my dad and everything so um, when it went in the, and then the celebration which just summed it up was just incredible that feeling is one of the best feelings I've ever had because the pressure was so intense and the rea- the, the feeling really was shit we're in big big trouble here you know Scotland would start to come into the game you know they, they, they were looking strong so that moment is is everything to us and shows you what football's all about. It's all about little moments. You could have played great and, of course, against Holland, everything we did went right. But um, that's that moment, that is exactly what was going through my mind. Do you think of Gaza, and this is supposition, do you think of Gaza's not playing in Scotland then? He doesn't choose the impish thing because I've always felt, because he'd been astonishing in Scotland, he'd been genuinely, and he'd begun to enjoy himself so much and he felt king of the walk. He was mucking around with McCoyst and Gorham and up there it was just pure head. But he's got Gorham to beat, it's Colin Henry. I, I think he's, if it's against any other side, he probably takes the, the easiest, coolest finish. But because it's Scotland, he's like, lads, <laughs> get ready. Every chance. I mean, because the boys used to wind him up about it and then, you know, oh, what, well, you won the, you won up in Scotland and all that. So they used to get all sorts of grief from the boys in the camp and that. So, but you could sense it before the game, but, you know, he's mucking around with Coisty and, and, and Andy Gorham. You knew he was desperate to score against Gorham. Absolutely desperate. And to do something like that and genius. I mean, that's exactly what it was. Uh, absolute, that's, you know, the first game he hadn't played great. He got all the stick because he was the main man for the dentist chair out in Hong Kong and all that. And he, did, he, did, he didn't say anything. He didn't retaliate. He just got on with his football and did what you should do. You answer on the pitch. And, it you know, the perfect story for Gaza to score against Scotland. I understand the relief to, to beat Scotland like that in group terms after the, the draw with Hodgson's side. Your hosts, you, you minimum want to be in the knockout and then see what happens. I understand that. But but every time I hear an England player who is part of that squad talking about the Holland game, it's rare in the modern game. I'm going to ask you later on about 1998 when I thought that you, you were a side that could and should have gone a long way. And again, untypically for Scott, I was furious that night against Argentina. But any English footballer who was involved with that squad that Holland game comes back in about how imperious you were as a side how beautiful the decision making the passing the space opening against a really good side I mean they might have been a little bit out of sorts but if you count off the names in that squad particularly the starting 11 you know you've you've kicked around a a really beautiful side one whose, whose core members were winning European trophies absolutely everywhere what what went so right and what did it feel like that day? It was an unbelievable feeling, it, just in terms of obviously we got to that point. But to be 4-0 up at Wembley against a top, top team, under the lights, that song's going round, football's coming home. The pressure of all these games, pressure of playing for England anyway, you know you better do well or you're going to get battered. You want to do well. You want to play well. It was... 
it just felt different. It was the game was at night. The pitch was a little bit quicker. Players were were now playing with were fuller confidence that we now believed after the Scotland game. Yeah, we're we're a good team. Let's go. We can we can do this. We knew the Holland game was going to be on paper the toughest game in the group. Things that you know, we just played a brand of football that Terry Venables had obviously had in mind for the two years building up to that. This is what it's about. This is where we he he had a vision of where how he wanted the team to play, and that was it. That was the performance that that he was waiting on and believed in from that team. And the goals we scored, the fact that Teddy got a couple, Gaz, uh, uh, Shearer got a couple, you know, the SAS, everything was perfect. Your strikers score two goals each. Gaz is back to his best. He's going through things, you know. It's a game that I remember that you couldn't get tired in. It was so surreal. The adrenaline was incredible. I literally feel like you're walking in, you know, on water, you, the song's going around. You're literally humming along to the song whilst playing. It's madness. You know, there's no pressure. It's like you're in the park with your your brothers and just enjoying playing football. It's It was the best half hour, I think, to just enjoy and be able to take it all in, which you don't normally do because there's so much going on and, you you know, there's so much pressure. You concentrated... Of course, you concentrate, but you're able to just take it all in, look around, and hum along, and it was it was unreal. It's an object lesson in in psychology and sport because if you if, if however you do it through endorphin or or David Patel and you know the lightning seeds, however you can relieve yourself of the pressure and go, I'm just going to do what I enjoy. No matter if it's pole vaulting or it's horse riding or it's football, you you you'll do it better. And if you enjoy it into the bargain, if you could feel like that in every match, you'd have played sixteen hundred matches rather than over, well over six hundred. Thank you for answering that question so nicely about Euro ninety six. Um, I, I, I said I wanted to stop somewhere, and if you're willing, because this is about you. But again, if you had a connection with them, you're our first hand witness. We're desperate in due course to, to get him to come on to this. The three of us who are behind this interview series, we've always felt that watching Teddy Sheringham was, um, I, I, I mean, not just a pleasure, but an education. He seemed to have ideas of space and timing. And, and he, he was one of the players, in, in particularly across the 90s, who consistently just did the right thing time and time again. I don't know if simplicity is genius quite encapsulates Teddy. I, I, I don't think it does. But he's a player who could have survived and thrived in any era of football because it, he just seemed to have a brilliant brain. But you played with him. You know him. What was it like playing with him? And try and, dis- try and give a better description of what Teddy Sheringham is and why he was an elite footballer. Well, I think the biggest thing is that he made you look a better footballer when you played with him because of his movement was was simple in terms of it were it, but it, on every occasion you, sometimes you just watch I can watch a striker now and they stand there and they wait for someone to pass the ball into them and the centre back comes in and nicks it N- never ever with Ted because his he would always have movement so if I had the ball out wide and he wanted the ball into feet he would go towards the opposition goal, a yard or two, and then come back and get it. And he'd have two or three yards of space. That made it easier to control. It's always opposite movement. If I got the ball deep in my own half, Teddy would come to me, towards me, just two yards, and turn and go the other way. Didn't have great pace, but we still get there because of that movement. It was incredible. And then his finishing, just how calm he was. The madness of it is, is that you watch some centre forwards now who want to come back and play and you know spray the ball around, but then don't get in the box and score the goals as well. Teddy did all that. So the the one that compares to that is of course Harry Kane that people were talking about now and the fact that he's making all these assists as well as scoring goals. Teddy did that for his you know for fifteen twenty years. That's what Teddy was all about. The opposite movement I think was the biggest thing for me. But also he loved scoring goals. So for me. I knew out wide I needed to get half a yard and whip the ball in to an area and Teddy would either be be 
drag, be go into the near post to come out wide or or go go out and come into the near post. It was just movement, and it was. I don't know if players, other players are lazy, but it is fairly simple. But t- no, Teddy had a obviously had a great upbringing in the game. Maybe knew that that pace that people talked about that he lacked, he had to do in order to get those yards of space. Um, but as he got older, he got, he got better, no doubt about it. I think going to Manchester United and winning things helped him and helped with the confidence of all that. Uh, but he was just, an inc- he could score every goal. Was a leader as well, was hard as nails. That's what I wanted to touch on, Darren, because, you know, it's been clear, and I tried to tease out in the first part, that you're made of tough stuff, that you've got a, um, a stern character, you're redoubtable, you deal with setbacks, and you do what you're born to do well. Teddy, whenever I met him or spoke to him, or whenever I listened to him or when I watch him, in the, in the best sense, he's a bit of a geezer, because I don't think pressure really got to him. I think I have seen few footballers who started at he, he was an English canton. I started around the pitch going, this is my day, this is my territory. I can turn my collar up if I want to or I don't want to. It doesn't matter because I am Teddy. And I think in elite sport, that part of your character actually helps a lot. Oh, for sure. And especially, you know, when he started out at Millwall, that sort of thing, you've got to be tough, right? Uh, he's a London boy. Always used to laugh. <laughs> he never had credit cards. He was all cash. <laughs> we were on the bus and all that. And he always wanted to play cards. Um just a good lad. I got on really well with him and still do. Um, he's still the same on the golf course. Slow as hell, but he grinds you down. He's desperate. You know, he wins. He's a good golfer. Um, good lad. Um, and looked after me, to be honest. I think he really helped me when I went to Thailand because I struggled the first, you know, six months. And he could tell what I was like. It was kind of funny, you know, when we spoke about it with my dad. And when we played Lazio in like, a game for Gaza... And I was playing out wide and I was just screaming and shouting, you know, give me the ball, da da da. And uh, we sat, he come, sat next to me on the plane on the way home and he went, You love a moan, don't you? You love it, don't you? <laughs> and I was only 20 and I'd only been there like, you know, a couple of months, but you'd go, oh, You'd love a moan, don't you? He said, That's, that's all right. He said, But you know, just you keep, sometimes just relax, you know. You're obviously a top, top player. Um, but he, he loved that about me and he was probably f- five years older than me and just came to the club as well. I was struggling and th- I think we just hit it off from there. He just he he knew what I was all about. I think that, you know, of course we talk about football, he reads people really well. He knows what people are all about. He's, he's, re- he's, he's smart. He's like a geezer, like you say. He th- doesn't take any rubbish from people. You know, no one's going to mug him off, as they would say. He's, he's very streetwise. And he was on the pitch and he knew how to look after himself. Uh, so when you had him in your changing room, you always felt like you had half a chance. I love that in life. I love that in football. I, I respect people like that. And I think it, it feels like as a Scot who grew up watching all the TV that was pumped to you from London, you were taught that London geezers were sharp or were a pace ahead, were funnier, which Teddy definitely is. He's very sharp, very witty indeed. To me, um, I adored watching him, and, and there are a lot of footballers you'd say, I wish they'd come back. But that connection between you and him for Spurs and for England was precious, and you'd bring it back in, a, in an instant if you could, if you had a time machine. It, it maybe could have happened at another club too, and um, another one of our socios, another one of our members who supports us is Tom Lee, who's been with us forever and ever, and, and he just says, he seems to remember that there genuinely was a possibility. As much as you became attached to Spurs and Spurs was your club and you renewed time and time again. He remembers that there was an opportunity um, when one of the greatest of them all, Alex Ferguson, wanted you. Tom thinks, Tom asks specifically, were you close to joining Manchester United and were there other opportunities to join big clubs when you were at your absolute peak for Spurs where you had to stop and think a couple of seconds to say, no, I'm staying or, or boy, no, I fancy that one. Yeah, I think yeah, the United thing was was definitely real. Uh, when I signed my second contract at Spurs, we uh, my agent Leon Angel he he put something in the contract which I didn't even think about. It was just that if a club offered over, I think it was four million quid, I could speak to them. So what it kind of did, it meant that there was no 
length to the contract because if someone offered that, that you know, it wasn't that I wanted to leave. He just put it in there. He said, you know, why, you know, gives you the, maybe a bit of freedom if that were to happen. I didn't even see, see it as there being a need for it to be in there, but it, but it was. And then I had a great year, ninety four, ninety five, and I, you know, I was now part of the England team. And you know, whenever there was a game, I was playing it. And I remember playing the Umbro Cup and we played Sweden and I scored the equaliser in the last minute with one of my favourite goals, which I volleyed in off both posts. I remember we played Stuka that night in the at the hotel up in Leeds and Gaza was up there messing around and all that, we were all playing Snooker and then uh, Gary Pallister was was playing with me. He just said, uh, oh, Gaffer's desperate for you to come. come. I went, OK. And he... He had the same age as me. And he went, is there some little clause about, you know, maybe leaving? And I was like, uh, maybe, but I don't know. I was like, yeah, maybe. So that was that. And then we played Brazil on the Sunday. And uh, I remember my agent, being Leon, was the, at the game and in the players' lounge afterwards. And I was going to America the next day. And he said, well, I, the chairman's on the phone. He said, well, he w- wants us to come round to the house. We've got to go and see him. I said, what? He went, yeah, I, you're going on holiday tomorrow, we better go around there. Because I think he's, it's panic stations. You know, Fergie wants you, he's going to, you know, he's definitely going to be paying off for more than that. So, oh, okay, so we went around there, spoke to the chairman. I said, yeah, no, I'm happy to stay. And I don't, you know, I was, and I was, I was really, you know, buzzing to stay. So I just spoke to him. He just wanted a bit of reassurance that I was happy to sign another contract to get rid of that clause. Um, and Fergie had had some problems with Andre Konchelskis that at the end of that season so he was going to be moving on uh, spoken to Paul Parker I'd played with, with, with England and I think Parks said yeah go for it <laughs> for sure uh, I went on holiday to America Kate, I remember flying back and there was Fergie had said something in the press that there's only one person he wants that summer and it's me uh, so when I got back I remember speaking to him he called the house and I just said, yeah, you know, he's like, love you, want you to come up. I had a problem with Kontelskis, it looks like he's going to move on. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I'd love to come up and have a chat and have a little look around. Uh, and kind of left it at that. The next day, from that point, back round to the chairman's house. And he basically didn't let me leave the house without signing the new deal. So um, I was really happy at Spurs. I was also, I feel like I'm a loyal person. Spurs were... And the fans were so good to me the first three or four months I was there when I was really struggling. The media were battering me. The fans were not the exact opposite. Um, And I just felt like I didn't want to jump ship. Of course, I knew it was an amazing opportunity. uh, But Hughes, Ince and Konchelskis were leaving. And I just thought I might be better off where I am. And Euro 96 is coming next year. I knew that was going to be a big thing. I was desperate to be part of it. I thought if I went to United, maybe, and I struggled like I did when I first went to Spurs, would it turn into a disaster? Would I then lose my place in the England team? But it all, and it all boiled down to me being happy where I was. And so when I look back at it now, I mean, I guess I also thought that the opportunity would come again. I had that belief that... I was just 23. I was arguably one of the best players in the country. I felt like I was at that time, as that obviously was the reason that Fergie came in for me and wanted me to go there. Um, so I think that, being honest, I think there was, I felt like it could happen in the future without a doubt. He didn't have a lot of luck with that group, Dan. If you think about it, he tried and failed to get you. He, he genuinely thought Shearer was walking in the door when, when Shearer eventually backed out. He tried so hard to get Gaza, didn't get Gaza. You know, it's extraordinary that um, a man, because he's a character, I mean, he's a tough man, he, he doesn't forgive people who say no easily, but he's a charismatic man. He's not just, I, I obviously knew him from my time at Aberdeen and throughout my reporting career. And one of the things I'd say about him is that it's not just about the trophies, it's not just about how he manages you when you're a player. He is a very charismatic man, and I think that saying no, although you've laid out really intelligent criteria for saying, no, I'm happy here, and the loyalty one chimes with everybody who loves the game. 
that if we saw more of that, we'd all be happier. But he was a charismatic man and difficult to turn down, I think. Definitely. But then so was Sir Alan Sugar when I went round to his house. <laughs> and that, I think that's what was important to me. Jerry Francis was literally saying, if you go, I think I'll go chuck it in. Um, you know, Jürgen was leaving. Uh, Nicky Barnby was homesick. Chica Popescu was going to Barcelona. Um, and that team kept together would have been unbelievable. And I think for me to go as well might have been the last straw, even to the point that when I had decided to stay and Sir Alan Sugar wanted to do a press conference in order to announce that I was staying, that it was a big deal. And I remember, I was, that, of course, it was the summer. I remember Teddy phoning me uh, in, in a panic that I was going to be leave him because he told there was this press conference and I was like oh my god surely not don't tell me you're going as well but and I went no 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 I've, I've signed I've, it's to announce that I've signed so it's all, all good <laughs> all good see you next week and he was like he was relieved unfortunately he phoned me two years later same time of year to say I've, got, I've just signed for United and was laughing his ass off <laughs> Which absolutely devastated me. So, um, you know, we kind of, we still laugh about it. And he obviously says, God, I wish you went there. You know, what a... You'd have loved it up there, you know, with those players and with that, with, Al, with Sir Alex. But, you know... At the time, Dan, I mean, this is now just flakes of fancy, but I followed... I, I watched one of my duties was to report Chelsea were pretty big at the time, and Manchester United. And during that treble season, I, I was sent to cover every Champions League game. And I remember Fergie going at that stage. David Beckham wanted to play in centre midfield. There was a host of clubs before he went to Real Madrid when they fell out that wanted Beckham. He Beckham was, you know, he really felt that he could command in centre midfield. He, he ultimately had to play there in the majority of the 99 final. And, and Ferguson had said, long after you'd said no to him, there's only one player. If I could get three, got to go there. But had you been brought in at that stage, David Beckham was emerging at the club. Um, you were similar generations. I mean, what do you think his thinking was? You on the right instead of David Beckham? You in the middle with Beckham right for United? Or how, how might it have worked, given that you, you, you spent quite a lot of time in the international side playing with David Beckham? How do you imagine it might have evolved? Well, I think it would have been tough because, I mean, because you've got to think of the rest of the midfield. You've got Giggsy and Scalzi and Roy Keane. So, um I, well, I obviously when he wanted me to go there was to go there and play right midfield and be and be that and that was probably another reason why me like Bex actually wanted to play centrally because of that frustration that I told you about I want to be involved in the game I don't want to be stood out wide I think at United it might have been different because they're dominating seventy percent of the get possession in games you get in the ball in a bit of space and that would have been great like it was for Bex you know get the ball. Oh, you know, whip it in, you know, dr drop your shoulder. I mean, that's what I was all about. And that's why I created and, you know, assisted a lot of goals from that position. But I did want to play centrally. I did see myself playing centrally for that reason. So, funnily enough, Glenn Hoddle always had a vision of us both playing in the same team for that reason, that we could both do both jobs and we could switch within a game. And that would create flexibility. And, of course... When we went to the World Cup, we both played pretty well and scored the two go two goals against Colombia. So he was right there. But um, I would have seen myself playing in the form I was was in at Spurs that year and for England as well. I didn't see, you know, I saw myself going there, and of course, playing. But Bex, I think Sir Alex Ferguson most certainly had me to go there to play in that midfield four without knowing just how good Bex would become. Uh, and, you know, the others coming through. I mean, you know, Alan Hansen, you know, you don't win anything with kids. Uh, that was the summer that I'd said no. So I think no one really saw it coming, uh, and myself included. Then it, it leads me to close on a couple of items. And, um, you know, they involve you, I suppose, and Beckham too. I'm going to close with a, 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 a sponsor's question, but I have to ask you, Darren, because, again... As a Scot, I was at um, France 98 covering the England national team and I got really angry. I got angry about the way in which um, 
you know, Beckham was treated right from the start when he was dropped and he was on the on the bench in the opening game. I think that was Tunisia. And then the Colombia game was a really thrilling performance, a good win, qualification. And, and in that game against Argentina, it has to be, although it's a sore classic, it has to be regarded as one of the modern classic games. And prior to that tournament, FIFA put round a circular saying the tackle from behind is a red card. That's it. Here are referees. It is a simple way forward. It's a, in that mad game where two sides of high quality are playing flat out back and forward, and Diego Simeone comes through Beckham. Beckham does what he does. And Kim Milton Nielsen sends Beckham off and leaves Simeone on the pitch. And then what happens, and I personally think that maybe Glenn Hoddle handled it. But no, I, I can be as, as frank as you. He handled it badly. I, I thought he handled it really badly. And Beckham's hung out to dry a little bit. But I, I, on the pitch, afterwards, now, Am I saying things that chime with you? Because I thought that was a horrendous decision by the Danish referee. And and I'd go so far as to say inexplicable. Yeah, well, it was. And of course, for us, that's, you know, the only World Cup I played in and that he'd taken away my opportunity to go further in the tournament. And, you know, you know that's the dream, to go try and win a World Cup. And that's taken away from you with a, a decision that was the wrong decision. You can dress it up however you like. Um I think the tournoi, <clears throat> the tournoi the year before, Bex picked up a couple of bookings, silly bookings with a little bit of petulance. Hoddle called him out for it and said, "Look, you know, you can't do that. That might cost us." That's you know, Glenn being Glenn, um, <clears throat> he was right, but it, you know, it's never a sending off, never in a hundred years. The tackle from behind was what it was, but you know, obviously we had to get on with that, and of course we still performed in, the, in that match and managed to take it to penalties. We had Sol Campbell's goal disallowed, which was very harsh. It was a horrible way to go out of the tournament. I mean, we lost to the Germans on penalties and now and now against Argentina as well. I mean, we played... That first half was one of the best 45 minutes of football I'd ever played in. It was unreal. I mean, I feel like I... It took me longer to get into my flow in Euro 96 after coming back from the injuries that, that year. But I felt uh, at the World Cup, I was into it straight away and I've never felt so fit and the pace and the quality of that game was incredible. Uh, we were 1-0 down through a penalty. The next 40 minutes, we were sensational. It was unbelievable football. I think Scolzi might have put scored another one. I think there was one that was disallowed because the ball had just gone out. We could have been 3 or 4-1 up. It was unreal. And the the... I guess of football where sometimes everything does go right this was a game where it didn't they scored that one minute before half time and that five minutes after half time changed everything the goal that they scored was a good goal from them no doubt about it uh, really clever yeah um, and I don't think you can blame anyone but you just of course you think oh my god why didn't we stop that how did we stop that it was a good goal it was a good goal so to go in at 2-2 was so deflating considering how we played it really was um, but the belief was well okay carry on doing what we do we'll, go to, we'll, we'll beat these you know no, no doubt but then of course the referee indecision changes everything and we in the end we did well to get get to penalties and I never forget it it was, it was, a, it was a tough tough one like, there was a lot of tears in that changing room um, you know the manner in which it, it happened was was really tough to take and then of course, when we're outside, you know, waiting outside our bus with our families and that, and you've got the Arg Argentinians come by banging on the windows, giving us all sorts of shit. It was made for a pretty nasty evening. I, I guess one way to look at it as we stop now with the last question is that football wouldn't be so beautiful if you didn't have to go through cruelty and, and grief. And, and that was a brutal, brutal night. Our sponsor, Spec365, asked a good one to close on, Darren. What advice? Because many people look at this England squad and think that however it's conjured up by Gareth Southgate, there's a lot of talent. There's some players who've won tournaments at junior level before. The English game has advanced in terms of possession in tournaments a great deal. There are a lot of people who are good at dead ball situations. Their question is, what advice would you give the England players who will be playing some of their games at home in a major tournament? If you can draw from what you learned across your career and project forward to this summer, 
when England are, you know, largely going to be at Wembley. What advice would you give them? Play with freedom and enjoy it. Um, you're going to be so excited <laughs> that you've got to control it. And I think the first game against Switzerland, you know, you I mean, we'd gone two years with playing friendlies to then, which were huge. And of course, I loved it. That was the adrenaline was incredible. But this was different. And we started well and still got the goal. But that nervous energy and that everything about it, get to that point where I said in the Holland game where you've got that freedom and you're just walk it, walking on water and you're just enjoying it and go and express yourself and that that's what it's all about you know and I, that's why I love Gareth I think he gives them that freedom I th- I really do you you know all the, there's lots of quality in a lot of teams you, it's about how those boys play and how you create things in that final third and we've got players who can do it so that's the biggest thing for me you, you've got to control that excitement and that nervous energy to get to that point where you're playing with freedom and, and enjoying it and if we can do that then we're going to have a hell of a chance well I, I hugely hope for your sake that you, you get that thrill of a run far in the tournament probably escaping the group having won the other two games and lost heavily to, to Scotland obviously that's 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 a given. That's a given. Look, Darren, I'm I'm honest to my word, but before I let you go, I have to say that that was just a pure joy. It, it's always fantastic to speak to somebody who's achieved our dreams and the listeners' dreams, but can describe it well and with enthusiasm. We've asked you to go back to good and bad times, and it's been a genuine pleasure. It's been uplifting listening to you. Um, it, it, you've given an example of why the big interview exists so we're hugely grateful to you Tom and Will, our socios, will be as well all I can say to you is thank you very much indeed um, the big interview owes you one and thank you for making your fantastic career sound wonderful today it's such a crack of dawn moment for you over in the United States Darren Anderton, listen, thank you very much play up Pompey, thank you very much indeed my pleasure, thank you very much for having me appreciate it